Hello, my name is Van King. Today's topic is Franklin Ogdensburg Minerals, a tale of micromounts, fluorescence, gems, giant crystals, and species. Before we continue any further, I should let you know that this is a project that has been worked on by many, many people. We have major museums around the world who are working on chapters, and those chapters will be coming in shortly, and as they do, they will be listed among the people who are on the table of contents of the book. We've been working on this for four years, and we hope to have a really fine book about the minerals of Franklin and Ogdensburg and what do they look like. First of all, you need to know where Franklin, New Jersey is. It is a very urban area. You see a triangular portion of the map in the center, this overhead view. The green water is the buckwheat pit and part of the Taylor pit. There were a number of mines on this ore body that include those that go northerly from this water-filled area, and they include some of the famous localities such as the Parmer Mine, the Trotter Mine, and the Parker Shaft Mine. I will call attention to the very top of the photo in the center. There is a straight line which represents the railroad bed. And to the right of it, there is a wooded area and a slightly housed in area that included what is called the mill site. And much of it was recovered in 2006 and brought down to the Franklin Mineral Museum. The Franklin Mineral Museum is located just to the lower left of the green water-filled pit. You can see a white area where there is collecting, preserved, and there are six million pounds of waiting to be looked at minerals in that reserve, and they have become available recently for mineral collectors. This is the Palmer No. 2 mill. It is a factory that was responsible for processing all of the Franklin ores it was built in 1898. This is a 1920s-era photograph showing the Palmer shaft, head frame in the center of the field of view, and all of the processing buildings around it. This is the buckwheat pit. The buckwheat mine is one of the remaining open pits in the area that you can still find. The right-hand cut that you see in more or less the center is the extension of the ore body to the Taylor mine. To the left, there is a darkish area that is the extension of the ore body that went up toward the Trotter shaft and other mines. The ore vein made a U-shaped cross-section between the cut that you can see of the Taylor mine and of the left-hand Franklin vein. The buckwheat dump is available for mineral collecting during the entire season the mine museum is open. The Franklin Mineral Museum operates this as part of your experience to visit the locality and the mine, and you can see plenty of minerals here available. The chances of finding new minerals to science in this locality are very high, and it is the most mineral-rich locality in the United States. Sterling Hill is the sister locality to Franklin and the mill that was associated with it. This photo is also in about the 1920s. If you look behind the mill, you will see the open pit called the Passaic Mine. It was mostly a manganese-rich locality that produced zinc ore. There is also a saddle between the hills that you can see, and that leads to another mine called the Noble Mine. When you go into the Passaic pit, you can see the ore body, the black vein in the center of the field of view, and it is in contact with white Franklin marble. Between the whitest portion of the marble and the ore vein, there is a kind of creamy green to yellow looking rock, and that is the surface where there has been interaction between the ore body and the marble. On the left-hand side of the vein, there is yet another reaction zone where very interesting minerals have been found. The interior of the mine is still available for visiting. 
The Sterling Hill Mining Museum operates tours throughout the year, and this is a view of the zero level. All of the other levels underground are not available because they have been flooded. It's interesting, you can see you're walking through the ore vein itself. The big black pod in the center is a mass of Franklinite. As you go through the mine, you will see fractures that have been stained black. These fractures are famous for mineralization and in former times when the mine was operating deep down underground, many rare minerals were found along them. Don't try to collect on these veins, by the way. They're barren. Uh, they wouldn't like it if you started beating on the walls of the museum. But anyway, this is the kind of occurrence that fracture minerals would have appeared to a miner. So what are the minerals? What's important? The interesting thing is that there are four major minerals. Rhodonite, Franklinite, Willemite, and Zincite. Rhodonite perhaps is one of the most important, or at least one of the very interesting ones as far as collectors are concerned, because it is a bright pink. This is a fracture surface that is coated with bladed rhodonite crystals. On the lower right portion, there are dusty places where there is botryoidal white datolite. Uh, particularly in the upper central portion, you can see white datolite on top of rhodonite blades. On the lower left portion of the specimen, there is a white crystal of barite intersected by pink rhodonite crystals. Micromounters particularly appreciate rhodonite from this location. And this is an interesting specimen showing the bright pink rhodonites interacting with some colorless willemite crystals, two of them. Very interesting because they have a flat termination. And there is bright yellow axonite, MN. Note the field of view of this is one centimeter. The next mineral that is one of the essential ones that a Franklin mineral collector has to have a good example of is Franklinite itself. This is a specimen from the Sterling mine. It's a huge specimen from the Ecole de Min in Paris, France. Uh, the interesting thing is that the bigger the crystal of Franklinite, the sharper it looks. If you're after micromounts of Franklinite, they're relatively scarce. Note that the Crystal below the Franklinites is a doubly terminated Willemite crystal. This is a close-up of what a fine micromount of Franklinite should look like. It has black crystals that are very, very dark, smooth, and shiny. The one crystal that is illuminated well is an etched crystal. Very minute etched faces have captured the light of the incident rays of the lighting equipment, and you can see a almost glowing aspect of this crystal. Move it just slightly, and it would be absolutely black. It has interesting faces on it. It has not only cube faces with the octahedron, but also the tetrahexahedron. Some of the Franklinite from Sterling Mine can be cubic. This was one that shows a very pronounced cubic habit and of front two edges, center and to the left are the tetrahexahedron. The pale pink mineral associated with it is a rare mineral called Hodgkinsonite. The third of the species that you should have a good example in your collection, if you collect Franklin, is zincite. This is some unusual zincite that is yellow. It also shows the flat basal pedion. The frequent crystal shape that people see is shown in the very bottom of the cluster, which has a very sharp tooth-like pyramidal termination. The specimen also has interesting associates. The white needles to the left are chlorophenocyte, and the sparkly crystals in the top left center are Hodgkinsonite. Note also that there's a black Franklinite just intersecting the top of this cluster of zincites. The classic zincite crystal color is from Franklin mine only, not from the Sterling mine. This shows the tooth-like termination I talked about. 
But notice the intersection with the calcite matrix. It's not a flat termination. It's a very irregular growth. Most of the time, you only see these pyramidal terminations and not the flat ones. The best crystal is at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. It is a crystal that is three centimeters tall. It's very sharp, shows some smooth faces, and has interesting matrix to go along with it. The white in the matrix is Sussexite, and the orange-brown is Friedelite. Note the marker shows how large the crystal is, uh, one inch on the left, one centimeter on the right. This is a rock courier photograph, and he made this image many, many years ago. Willemite, the fourth of the species that you have to have a good example of. And it turns out that sharp crystals are fairly scarce. This is an interesting, slightly larger than thumbnail cluster of Willemites. It's the variety Trustite, the manganese-rich red-brown crystals. And you can see the hexagonal prism and various rhombohedral face combinations on the terminations. The queen of the Willemite crystals are the so-called rice grain textured specimens. These little green crystals on top of druzy andradite garnet formed on a fracture on ore. You can see the ore consists of a green Willemite and black Franklinite. The specimen shows transparent Willemites. It is attached to gray-blue tephrawite and there is a lot of andradite garnet, the olive brown crystals in the matrix. If you look at the transparent crystal that is dominant to the right, you see the striations that move around the side of the crystal, and you can see them through the backside. Absolutely transparent mineral. Willemite has many, many faces. It can be white, as in this example. They all fluoresce in shortwave and longwave ultraviolet to different extents. The crystals here that are white are also very striated, have a satiny appearance to them, and they are with matrix of purple, tephra white, and greenish brown andradite garnet. And willemites may actually be acicular, needle-like crystals. These are shooting through a crystal of colicite, red-brown in color, and it is from the Sterling mine. But you can find both of these kinds of Willemites either at Franklin or Sterling. The black crystals that are on the Willemites are the rare mineral heterolite. Willemite can make gems. This is a beautiful combination of rough crystal and a faceted gem. They are in the same size proportion the gem itself is six millimeters in diameter. White willemite is a real treasure to have. This is a large, wonderful specimen, and we will look at some of the details of this photo. Uh, in the center, you see that there is a large crystal about a centimeter across, and we'll focus in on that particular one and several crystals nearby. The willemite can have a striated prism, flat termination, and hexagonal outline. Notice that some of the associated crystals you can see the terminations on, such as the one in the lower right-hand corner has a so-called orange peel texture. And you'll see that around the rest of the field of view. Another nice cluster on the same specimen shows a little bit more crystallographic enrichment than the other ones, but basically have the C pinacoid with the orange peel texture and the hexagonal prism. This is the end of part one. We hope you'll go on to see part two and part three, but first we'll take you to a few slides that you might find very interesting. We didn't show much in the way of fluorescent minerals in this first part, and what I'd like to assure you is that the book will be full of fluorescent images. These particular ones won't be featured in the rest of the talk, so we're going to show them mostly as a teaser. 
The first fluorescent mineral I'm going to show you is a really remarkable four-color specimen that you sure to enjoy. It's from Franklin. The uh, specimen is about 15 centimeters across. And on the left side, there is some bright green willemite and a dark zone full of blue hardystonite. The yellow mineral on the right-hand side of the dark vein is esperite. And, of course, the pink on the right-hand side is calcite. The non-fluorescent material in this specimen is mostly franklinite. The second one we're going to talk about is another Franklin specimen. It, too, has bright yellow esperite and, of course, the obligatory red calcite. There is a little bit of green willemite, particularly on the right-hand lower side of the fluorescent area. But... The hard-to-see, beautiful midnight blue hardystonite going through the middle of the specimen. The non-fluorescent material is mostly franklinite. Specimen is also about 20 centimeters across. The third specimen we're looking at is a rare fluorescent, one that you may not have seen very frequently. The green mineral, very peculiar tint, is genthelvite. Of course, the red is calcite. The left-hand side has Franklinite, not fluorescing. It's a huge specimen, though. This is 25 centimeters across. It's the, one of the largest pieces that have ever been found in the world for this species, not just from Franklin. The fourth specimen we're going to look at is a pure piece of esperite with only the tiniest amount of willemite, a little bit of calcite, and some Franklinite in it. It is, of course, from Franklin, and it is also about 12 centimeters across. It's a huge, pure, wonderful specimen of esperite. Uh, all of the images that you've seen so far have been in shortwave ultraviolet. We'll be showing specimens in the book that are in long wave and in mid-range. The one thing that we need to ask you about is if there's any way that you would be willing to give us some money because that's always the sales pitch. It's going to cost about $25,000 to print the book. Uh, we don't have that money. I hope that you would click on the PayPal link on the next slide. And even if you send us a dollar, if 20,000 people did that, we would have $20,000. So whatever you can send, we'd really appreciate it. The information about where to send the PayPal money will be in the next slide as well. Thank you very much.